Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome everyone to MotorWeek podcast number 213. And joining me in Studio C at Motor Week World Headquarters today is writer-producer Brian Robinson. Hello, John. Road test producer Ben Davis. Hello no there. relation. No I relation. Say. No relation. Wish you were, but you're not. <laughs> Online content coordinator hmm. Greg Carlos. Also no relation and, and to anyone. Greg is also <laughs> the producer. Don't wish you were. Yes. Neither one of your wills. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we're speaking of that. <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk about some of the cars we've recently tested. We've got an interesting lightning round. Uh, viewer question from Frankie in Tennessee. Uh, any rant and raves we'll get to. And so let's start. Brian Robinson recently came back from the midsize truck challenge that we participate in along with cars.com. Brian, you want to kind of lay out the groundwork? What, who were yeah, the contestants and who uh, won and why? Like many of these things, it's kind of a mixed bag. I'm sure we'll get a lot of grief over, uh, mainly because the four trucks we had there, uh, it was a GMC Canyon, Jeep Gladiator, Ford Ranger, and Honda Ridgeline. And the Canyon was representing GM, so it also included the Chevrolet Colorado. Notice that there was no Tacoma or Nissan Frontier. So, obviously, Tacoma is the big one, and uh, Toyota just didn't want to participate for uh, whatever reason. I think they have an updated one coming out eventually. and didn't think they would uh, be competitive, so they didn't feel like losing, despite the fact that they sell more, more of those than exactly. Else, yeah. I was going to say, just kind of make that clear because that's probably one of the big questions we get yeah. in our comparison yeah. test. Why isn't something included? And right. it's because manufa- we've asked. Yeah. It's just a manufacturer can choose whether or not they want to participate. And the Frontier hasn't been updated in, what, 20 years, something like that. So. Yeah. And there's uh-huh. a new one of that coming. But it is it is kind of interesting that the Tacoma didn't want to participate because yeah. it is a very capable truck. But there you go. So the Canyon finished in fourth, uh, mostly because just an older design. Um, and maybe and they were afraid that's what would happen to Tacoma. Even with the Denali trim, the interior was nowhere near as nice as the others. You can't even get uh, push-button start. You still use the key, et cetera. You had a question? Yikes. Yeah, you're scoring – it was uh, different than what a lot of people might think off the bat, wasn't it? Was it, uh, it wasn't like heavy dutiness and towing capacity and stuff like that. It was uh, more everyday comfort kind of deal? Um, that's was part of it. But no, we scoring? did do acceleration with and without uh, loads in the bed. We put 1,000 pounds worth of bed. Gotcha. We did accelerations. And we didn't do any towing or any off-roading, anything like that. These are medium, you know, duty pickup trucks, midsize. Um, so, you know, things would have shaken out differently if we would have done any off-roading, of course, because the Gladiator finished third place, which... That probably would have done better if it had been a That's the newest design, test. so I'm sure everyone is going to go crazy about that. And there's a lot to like about the Gladiator. If you're a Jeep fan and you've been waiting for this truck, you will, you know, freaking love it. But when it, when you stack it up against the Ranger and, and other things in this segment, it just has way less payload capacity. It was the slowest at the track. The Ranger was faster at the track with a thousand pounds in the bed than the Gladiator was with an empty bed, and that's a V six. So, and then you, you know you got the uh, cluster, you know, the interior is it's not claustrophobic, but it's just you know kind of quirky Jeep stuff you got to deal with on a daily basis. And um, so plus it was you know the thing that sold it uh, sealed the deal though was it, it was ten grand more than any other truck here. So not only are you getting less capability, less comfort. You're paying ten grand more for basically Jeep style and the ability to go off roading. Um, so Ranger was Ranger finished second. Um, that was the only one uh, without a V6 that had the EcoBoost uh, Turbo Four, but it was the fastest at the track. Um, the only thing that kept it from winning was probably just its interior comfort and and space. It is a little tight in there. People for we kind of mm-hmm. consider it an all new truck, but it's an older design from. Uh, European and yeah, Australian, and Australian Ranger, which so it's a smaller cab. It's made for narrower roads. Yeah, so there's just not as much room uh, inside as our winner, which was of course the Honda Ridgeline, and I can hear everyone groaning out there right now. Um, I've, you know, I among others give the Ridgeline a lot of grief for not being a true truck since it's a crossover-based vehicle with a bed on it, um, but. 
it's just as capable doing truck stuff than as everything else here, except for towing. You know, you can only tow thirty. Uh, I'm sorry, you can tow five thousand pounds, which some will uh, tow a little more than that. Um, certainly can't off road as much in it, but it's got a ton of features. The other don't, have, you know, others don't have tons of space inside. Uh, some tech, all the safety stuff that the others Very comfortable have. long distance. Vehicle. Yeah, not to mention the whole underbed storage space yeah. was huge. No one. Uh, Let me tell you that. a true story, and it sort of drives home this. I have a friend who runs uh, a furniture consignment shop, and over the last four years, he's had a full size Ram. Then he bought a used, a very nicely done used Frontier, which he only kept for about a year and a half, and now he's in a Ridgeline. And I ask him, why did you do that? Because, you know, his, he's not looking at heavy weights, and, you know, a six-foot bed is about all he really needs. But he said basically it was the comfort. Yeah. He said the comfort for because if he's got to take something, uh, you know, a couple hundred miles or something and spend more time in it, and he can carry five people comfortably. Yeah, it rides yeah. like an Accord. Yeah. And not to mention it was the cheapest truck here by that, far. That's amazing. Which, yeah, there's yeah. not too many comparisons you do where the Honda yeah. is the cheap one. But So that's why it shook out the way it did. Send all your questions to Greg. And he will answer. Uh, we'll send them back to Brian, <laughs> who will have a sarcastic and response. And he will start dancing his answers to you. <laughs> a sarcastic right. response, indeed. <laughs> Let's move on to um, a um, our next vehicle. This is the 2020 Lincoln Aviator. Uh, I'll set the tone. It's uh, come standard with a 2-liter turbo with 250 horsepower, a 2.7-liter twin-turbo V6 with 335 horsepower, and 380 pound feet of torque is optional. Uh, prices 50 to uh, high 80s if you get everything on it. Ben? There was a, a hybrid yeah. as well mm-hmm. that puts out even more numbers. They, the hybrid is like, what, 400 and uh, some horsepower, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and the equal yeah. amounts of torque. I mean, it's uh, effortless it's power amazing. whenever I mean, you re- need it. It's so high that one of our producers looked at the numbers and thought that's, that's got to be a mistake. 630 pounds of torque. Yeah, yeah 400 yeah. horsepower. Is that a plug in? Plug in. Yeah, it's a yeah. plug in, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, Lincoln is on their way back, no doubt about it. I mean, rebadged Fords are not what they're doing anymore. They are giving it to Cadillac full force. And um, this could be again, what, CT6? Hey, Cadillac, uh, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, as far as the interior goes, they're, they're there. CT, I mean, XT. 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 Yeah, well, I would say the Aviator is definitely bigger because the CT or XT6 XT. is a little small for the. Yeah. yeah, for the yeah. seven passenger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, sorry, go ahead. Go Price on. points are right there, though. Yeah, so pretty direct competitor almost. Um, they really upped their game uh, inside and out. I mean, you look at the thing on the outside, and it's got unique style to it. It's got beautiful curves. Uh, fit and finish is excellent. Inside is pampering you like uh, you know, like a high class mark mm-hmm. should, like um, comparable to Audi and Mercedes and such. Wow, that's quite a statement. Yeah, they're um, whoever's designing the interiors is putting the right colors with the right materials, and the trims are there. And there's a whole bunch of different choices to make. I mean, you can really customize this thing like it's you know something important first, to you. First Lincoln I've got into where I honestly could say I didn't see anything in there that, that told me it was a Ford product. Yeah, not right off the bat for yeah, sure. There's I'm a, sure there's something hidden there. There's around, clearly, yeah, they, they do have a lot of cool exclusive things going on, especially with stuff that you directly touch like steering wheel and stuff. Mm-hmm. They've got some cool uh some uh yeah, some cool buttons and stuff that operate hands-free voice and all that kind of stuff it's pretty wild it, it seems from watching your first drive which everybody should watch because it was a pretty good one um it seems thoughtful if that makes sense like the interior of a lincoln now seems like they've actually went through the the process of separating from ford so much it's not just saying well, let's give better leather or let's make no. this chrome you need like, let's actually trains. think about what makes yeah. the interior luxury yeah oriented and, and exactly make let's make this entirely our own which it's everybody a whole lot of lincoln right you have you seen the tv ads that are running in the pro they show uh, i'm sure it's matthew it? McConaughey. Matty McConaughey. They, they, uh, they still matthew mcconaughey all right all right, all right. he's Can, driving but then they show a profile you know car to car shot it looks like a locomotive it's got that long nose that drops off like a an old diesel locomotive from back in the 50s and 60s. It's can got, you even it's get got the real presence to it. Yeah, it's got everything it takes as long as they can put that. Uh, there wasn't any uh, two liters on the uh, the test that yeah, I went on. I don't remember seeing that you could even get a two liter. I thought the 2.7 was the base. 
as far as I know, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Oh, then this is. I must have read poor information. Uh, we're reading it off a, a crib sheet. Well, no, I was actually gentlemen. looking on the press site. Unless I really, yeah, yeah, unless I looked wrong, we can we can reconfirm. That's a good point, but could have been a Nautilus thing. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. It is possible. Yeah, when I'm at the events, they had the 2.7 and the 2.7 hybrid. Yeah. But the hybrid, yeah. So still, you're looking at a base 335 horse, 380, but it's got some power for sure. It's definitely tuned to be luxurious and have that freight train torque and and less of a barnstormer than, say, like a, a track hawk or anything crazy like that. If they get the if they get enough of them in the right hands, um, as far as uh, influencers and TV spots, and if they can get the public to associate Lincoln with where it's where it's at these days, I think they're in good hands. Well, it's kind of like the last chance for Lincoln. They've got to uh, they've got to do well. They put uh, it all out yeah, there, so really we'll see have. what happens. And for the you know, and it's you know, our major criticism has always been that uh, Lincoln were just gussied up Fords. And now they're finally making and, – and we, even when they started on this routine, we weren't so sure they were going to really do that, but and they in, have. In the grand scheme of things, not too long ago, that's exactly what they were, yeah. you know. Okay, let's move on now to a horse of a different color, the 2019 Ooh. Mazda 3 Hatchback. Let's see if we got it right this time. A 2.5-liter I-4 with 186 horsepower, six-speed auto or manual. All-wheel drive is available for the first time with the automatic transmission. A really nice car that we've always liked made nicer, made better. Comments? Did it, uh, in the small car wars, do you think it matters? Yeah, I think it's always been, as you mentioned, one of our favorites, mainly for the driving aspects of it. But it's it's always been a little noisy. Uh, interior's never been as nice. And like with the Mazda 6 and the CX-5 before it, they put a lot of money similar to Lincoln in the interior, making it a lot nicer. And quieting things up, so it's still a great package. And now they've added all-wheel drive, so well, that's a big deal. I thought yeah. the interior has really been upgraded, and it wasn't. It's not something that's so obvious when you first see it because it's still fairly plain. But the materials are, for the most part, much better. I, I like the, the. It's a better layout, even though the the uh, the the screen is still very prominent in the middle. It's just better. It felt like you were in a car that was a little bit more designed to be something other than just an entry-level car. Yeah, the only reason to buy the CX-3 was because you could get all-wheel drive. Now that this has all-wheel drive and has more storage room inside than the CX-3 utility, I really don't understand why you would buy a CX-3. I didn't in the first place, but... You (laughs) certainly get more... uh, You know, everybody likes likes to ride high these days and, and have a crossover. I understand that, but it doesn't really even ride that high. <laughs> um, I hear you. I'm on board with the Mazda 3, and I hope they uh, return to some of their sportier routes and bring a Mazda Speed edition in as well. I kind of miss that. Now, like, Subaru's backing out of the rally and trying to shake that whole hooligan image. Somebody needs to embrace it. Yeah, that would be my uh, nitpick on this, is that, like, now you have a Veloster N, and there's always the GTI and G- uh, G- uh, Golf R and things like that, which I think they're actually... Might be doing away with the Golf R in the current form. Anyway, uh, yeah, Mazda just needs to come back out with something to respond to that because they could it, easily dominate it. Yeah, I think they could, and it, I mean, it drives great now. But all right, let's let's start kicking it back up a little bit. And you can still get it the sedan as well, which uh, some people are going away from sedans, but uh, not Mazda. Okay, uh, I'm going to back up to this the— This just uh, in, breaking news, breaking news. Back up to the Lincoln. Back up to the <laughs> aviator. <laughs> Standard <laughs> engine is a 3-liter twin-turbo V6. And um, yeah. the uh, uprated engine with the hybrid is uh, optional. Yeah. So uh, we got that pretty much complete. Well, I think you're right. These are the specs for the— uh, yeah, that was a total snap. Nautilus. Okay. Uh, but we still liked it. Lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We loved it. <laughs> we loved it. A few weeks ago, Porsche announced that the all-electric uh, Taycan sedan lapped the Nürburgring in 7 minutes and 42 seconds. That's a production, listen to that word, It, it should be noted also EV that, record. that this is, I don't think it's an official time. because I, No, it was yeah, their time. It was their time. They have it on video. You can look at it, but it's not an official time It wasn't yet. sanctioned. Right. Almost immediately after, Tesla CEO Elon Musk took on to Twitter saying the Model S was on its way. Some drama and doubt ensued, but sure enough, a Model S was said, was said to have lapped the ring. 
in an unofficial 7 minutes and 24 seconds. So that's 16 seconds quicker. Now, there's some speculation as to the actual specs of the car. Speculation? Give me a break. They made the time runs. It was anything but stock. But it's safe to say that the performance EV wars have officially begun. Now that I've already expressed my opinion, what do you think? <laughs> is this, is this going to really amount to something? Well, Every think, time somebody comes out with a fast uh, electric car, the Musk is going to take something and lower it and take weight out and try and beat them? Yeah, I mean... That, Does it have any cred? That stuff aside, well, he's saying, Tesla is saying that what they ran there will be a production model eventually. Eventually. But okay. everybody knows that the tires were barely street legal, yeah. and we're hearing reports that it was stripped out. But I'm, I don't want to like focus on that. I think it's good that there's competition. And and the fact that we're dispelling the, this thing about a lot of people still think electric vehicles are slow. You, you got to respect what tesla did and they said we're going to bring the Mm -hmm. model s and they did uh they actually installed superchargers like that week which weren't there before they Mm -hmm. went over and just installed superchargers to charge up their car So that's cool uh yeah i mean the the wars have begun that's exciting for me and you know it's hard to say who would be a winner right now uh but i would personally put my money on porsche as far as like full track performance but you know they just there's a a recent article and i think it was in bloomberg talking about all of the tesla killers that have come out you know the jags and so forth and none of them have really put a dent in their sales and i don't know if if the porsche tycon will either but you know there is, a, there, the is mo- a, there is a there is a there is a mystery there. Yeah, Tesla I mean, is like an iPhone. I mean, yeah, people yeah, just it get it because buyer. that's what they have. Yeah, it is a different buyer. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, that's that. We didn't even ring the bell. Oh, there there it is. Moving on. Oh, Greg didn't get his full thirty seconds either because he kept like, getting <laughs> He had at least fourteen seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, from Frankie in Tennessee. Are there any reliability studies that are actually based on facts and figures instead of just surveys? The ones that are touted the most seem to be all survey-based. I know that not everyone takes the time and effort to fill out a survey. Let me start this off. The short answer is probably no. To my knowledge, manufacturers keep that stuff very close to the vest. There are two major reliability studies, actually a third, but the two that most people see is is Consumer Reports, which is an annual thing they do, and it's their readers and subscribers, plus some of their, their testing results. And there's J.D. Power. J.D. Power surveys 52,000 people uh, when they do their uh uh, per uh, when they do their reliability studies and is generally considered the gold standard because that's far more than your typical couple of thousand people for most surveys. Um, and a lot of people think that consumer report surveys are a little more biased because it's their readership. I think if you find something that stands up well and boasts, you're in pretty good stead. There's one other thing I'd like to recommend, though. Um, go to recalls.gov, the government's website on recalls. Look, Go to uh, the automotive recalls and look at their recent recalls. And if you see a vehicle you're considering in a recent recall, you might want to think, take that as a, a red flag that maybe there's some problems there that they haven't got sorted out. And that's my say. Anybody have anything to add? I would mo- yeah, I would mostly agree. I, I question a lot of these surveys because mm-hmm. most of most of the people, a lot of people like myself, uh, never fill out any surveys. Or and they then, fill out with all five stars. Right. And then there's people yeah. that just fill them out randomly and don't even care. And there's, but generally you find that people only fill them out if they feel strongly one way or another. If they really love their vehicle or they really mm-hmm. hate the vehicle. It's a good point. And you, as you mentioned with the consumer reports, I always tell that to people too that it is based on their readers, which I think makes it a little biased towards. You know, cars that their readers would buy, like Camrys and Accords, mm-hmm. versus you know the Jeep Wrangler is always going to vote poor because I'm guessing that not a lot of Wrangler owners are also Consumer Reports readers. But they've so, also added. That's why they've added some of their own test results. Into, well, they have two. They, they have an overall score yeah. that includes their test results, but then they have just reliability right. ratings, which are based on their surveys. So I don't know. Take it. Take from it what you will. But you know, would you agree that most cars today? are so reliable that we're, we're almost talking about nitpicks. And a lot of the stuff is 
subjective things, like you don't get the fuel economy I was promised. Correct. And even when you talked about the recall uh, info, that's almost all safety related. It's right. usually not reliability issues. It's not going to strand you on the side of the road. Yeah. And a lot of the complaints are have to do with uh, infotainment systems, not mm-hmm. you know parts breaking or whatever, just like people's frustration with technology. So I think, Frankie, our answer is is survey what's out there and take it, if you want, with a grain of salt. But probably collectively, it's it's not bad information. Anybody else got anything? How about rants and raves? Good question, Frankie. I like that one. Um, I'll rant, as I normally do, on people driving with <laughs> headphones in their ears in cars that I know for a fact have, like, Bluetooth or... Apple CarPlay or things like that. <laughs> and it doesn't directly affect me, like most things that bother me. But they can't necessarily hear what's going on around Yeah, I mean, that would be my argument and the fact that you're just being a jerk because, I don't know, like, because then they get out of the car with it and then it's like they're walking through the store with them in. Well, let when me I'm pit, talking to somebody let me with head- a scenario for you. <laughs> Guy in a parking lot, headphones in, pulls through to the open space across from him to, <laughs> to leave the parking lot. <laughs> What do you do? <laughs> citizen you do, uh, citizen police at that point? <laughs> no, I start cussing to the, my wife and daughter. Those are your two biggest rants in, in one in one situation. <laughs> yeah. I just I think at that point I just implode and it ceases to exist on this earth. <laughs> Sorry to take you off your topic, man. Yeah. So if you But I mean, I I would like to hear an argument as to why that's happening. In a car that was made in 2019. Maybe That's silent as a tomb on the inside. I have one maybe anyway. possible reason. Maybe they're too afraid to upload all their contacts and mm. all their text messages into the computer, into the car. So you can... So who knows what that stuff's yeah. where that stuff's going to after that? Yeah, but you're it's already on the phone. Way. I mean, Verizon or AT and T and Apple and Samsung. It's, it's already there. It makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah, I mean, who cares at that point? Who's I mean, got and it, Alexa's right? listening to every single word you say. So I mean, touche, my good man. Yeah. I just don't. Yeah. Very good. Maybe they just put so it in please there somebody to... please email me with an argument and I'll why should you refute that why argument are you as to why you're your, wrong. Uh, phone headphones in a car with Bluetooth or plug in. Uh, is it to cable. show off your AirPods? I mean, is it sh- is it a status <laughs> symbol? Uh-huh. I don't get it. Oh, okay, these earth shaking developments uh, keep us uh, on our toes. And I want to thank everybody for being a part of the podcast today. Brian Robinson, Ben Davis, and Greg Carlos. And Greg for producing uh, the podcast as usual. Jim Bigwood, our audio engineer who keeps us sounding clear as a bell. And our podcast creator, Bob Mixter. I hope you all have a chance to watch Motor Week on your local public television stations and on the Motor Trend cable network. If you have trouble finding us, go to our website, put in your zip code, and the station nearest you and time will pop up. Otherwise, for all of us at Motor Week, thanks for being a part of us, and we hope to have you coming back to visit us very soon. You've been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.